As the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, it's my pleasure and privilege to announce the winner of the Abel Prize for 2017. Styre i den norske vitenskapsakademi har besluttet å tildele Abelprisen for 2017 til Iv Meier for hans nøkkelrolle i utviklingen av den matematiske teorien om wavelets. The board of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters has decided to award the Abel Prize for 2017 to Iv Meier for his pivotal role in the development of the mathematical theory of wavelets. I'm a professor at the University of Oslo and the current chair of the Abel Prize Committee. Here is our citation. Fourier analysis provides a useful way of decomposing a signal or function into simply structured pieces like sine and cosine waves. These pieces have a concentrated frequency spectrum but are very spread out in space. Wavelet analysis provides a way of cutting up functions into pieces that are localized in both frequency and space. Yves Mayer was the visionary leader in the modern development of this theory at the intersection of mathematics, information technology, and computational science. The history of wavelets goes back over 100 years to an early construction by Alfred Haar. In the late 1970s, the seismologist Jean Morlet analyzed reflection data obtained for oil prospecting and empirically introduced a new class of functions called ondelettes or wavelets obtained by both dilating and translating a fixed function. In the autumn of 1984, Yves Meyer recognized that a recovery formula found by Morlet and Alex Grossman was an identity previously discovered by Alberto Calderon. At that time, Yves Meyer was already a leading figure in the calderon sigmund theory of singular integral operators. And this was the beginning of Meyer's study of wavelets, which in less than 10 years would develop into a coherent and widely applicable theory. The first crucial contribution by Meyer was the construction of a smooth orthonormal wavelet basis. The existence of such a basis had been in doubt, and as in Morlet's construction, all of the functions in Mayer spaces arise by translating and dilating a single smooth mother wavelet, which can be specified quite explicitly. Its construction, though essentially elementary, appears rather miraculous. Stéphane Mala and Yves Mayer then systematically developed multi-resolution analysis, a flexible and general framework for constructing wavelet bases, which places many of the earlier constructions on a more conceptual footing. Roughly speaking, multi-resolution analysis allows one to explicitly construct an orthonormal wavelet basis from any bi-infinite sequence of nested subspaces of L to R that satisfy a few additional invariance properties. This work paved the way for the construction by Ingrid Dobeschi of orthonormal bases of compactly supported wavelets. In the following decades, wavelet analysis has been applied in a wide variety of arenas as diverse as applied and computational harmonic analysis, data compression, noise reduction, medical imaging, archiving, digital cinema, deconvolution of the Hubble Space Telescope images, and the recent LIGO detection of gravitational waves created by the collision of two black holes. Yves Mayer has also made fundamental contributions to problems in number theory, harmonic analysis, and partial differential equations on topics such as quasicrystals, singular integral operators, and the Navier-Stokes equations. The crowning achievement of his pre-wavelets work is his proof with Ronald Koifman and Alan McIntosh 
of the L2 boundedness of the Cauchy integral operator on Lipschitz curves, thus resolving the major open question in Calderon's program. The methods developed by Mayer have had a long-lasting impact in both harmonic analysis and partial differential equations. Moreover, it was Mayer's expertise in the mathematics of the calderon sigmund school that opened the way for the development of wavelet theory, providing a remarkably fruitful link between a problem set squarely in pure mathematics and a theory with wide applicability in the real world. Okay, that's our citation. So it's a great pleasure for me now to give the word to Professor Terence Tao of the UCLA, who has agreed to give a presentation of the work of this year's Abel Laureate, Professor Eve Mayer. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. It is a, a great honor to present the work of uh, Yves Meyer. Um, as a graduate student, my uh, original field of study was harmonic analysis, and he was already one of the heroes of the field even then. So, uh, as you just heard, uh, Yves Meyer has made many contributions to both pure and applied mathematics. Um, in fact, many times he would first work on a subject motivated purely by theoretical considerations, and only later would, would it be realized that it actually had a great impact in applications also. Um, so, for example, in his early work on um, quasi-crystals is, is a great example of this. Um, so, uh, Yves Meyer was studying a question of purely theoretical interest. He was, he was studying the distribution properties of certain, sp certain special numbers, called Pizot numbers, uh, like the golden ratio, that have many um, uh, interesting number theory, theoretic properties. And uh, he found that these numbers were related to a certain type of set, uh, which we now call a Meyer set. And these are um, um, uh, examples of sets that are not quite periodic, in that they don't repeat themselves regularly, but they are what's called quasi-periodic. Um, they repeat themselves, but not in a regular fashion. Um, so, uh, for example, um, on this line here, you see these green dots. Uh, this is an example of a one-dimensional Meyer set, these green dots. Um, it's not quite periodic, but it has patterns that repeat um, 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 themselves. So, for example, you see here there's a short interval between these green dots and then a long interval. And then it repeats again, you have a short interval and then a long interval. But then it doesn't repeat, there's a long interval, and then there's a short interval and a long interval. So, there are repetitions of patterns, but the repetitions are irregular. So, it is not periodic, but it's what's called quasi-periodic. It, it does share many features in common with periodic sets. Um, so um, they have a very similar uh, Fourier spectrum, for instance. Um, on the left here, we have a two-dimensional example of a quasi-periodic set. Um, so you can see several patterns in the set repeat themselves. For example, there's a little circle here, uh, which again repeats itself over here, and then it repeats itself over here, sort of, but you know, not quite. Uh, the repetition is imperfect, um, and the gaps are not completely regularly spaced. Um, so it is not perfectly periodic, but it does resemble a periodic set in, in many ways. These are these quasi-periodic sets. Um, and Meyer developed um, a theory for describing these sets and how to build them. Um, so what one of the most important uh, realizations he had was that you can describe these quasi-periodic sets in terms of periodic sets of higher dimension. So for example, on the right-hand side, this one-dimensional um, quasi-periodic set of green dots, you can actually construct using this um, higher dimensional periodic set of black dots. So these black dots uh, are arranged in this lattice. This is a completely periodic um, set. Uh, you, can you can look at, at the black dots inside this strip. In between these dotted lines, there's a certain number of black dots. And if you project those black dots onto this line, um, you create this, uh, this Meyer set, this quasi-periodic set here. So you can, you can create this quasi-periodic set from a higher dimensional periodic set. And, and similarly, this complicated quasi-periodic object actually comes from a higher dimensional periodic object. Um, so uh, this was his theoretical work. Uh, 10 years after his work, um, uh, chemists actually discovered quasi-crystals in real life. They actually discovered uh, um, uh, arrangements of matter that were not periodic, but uh, exhibited uh, quasi-periodic structure exactly as, as described by Meyer. In fact, uh, Dan, Dan Schechtman won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery of quasi-crystals. Um, <coughs> another thing that, uh, another area that Meyer has worked in is the study of uh, partial differential equations, uh, particularly uh, fluid equations, like the Navier-Stokes equations, 
these are equations that govern fluids like water or air. Um, they're used in weather prediction. They're used to model um, um, uh, aerodynamics of, of, of planes and so forth. Um, but they're very complicated equations, um, and we still don't fully understand them, um, or even how to solve them for long periods of time. Um, and one of the main reasons for this is the phenomenon of turbulence, that, um, that you, uh, when you solve these equations, um, you may have initial conditions that are very smooth, that have no fine-scale structure, but as you evolve the equation, you, you, the fluid mixes with itself, um, eddies appear, um, and energy gets transferred to finer and finer scales, and you get very complicated behavior, um, which becomes very hard to numerically simulate. Um, and uh, the theory of these equations is still uh, not fully resolved. Um, for example, development of singularities. Um, but Mayer has worked on this, uh, and using his theory of wavelets, for example, he has clarified it, um, to some extent the, uh, um, how energy can be transferred from low frequencies to high frequencies and so forth. Um, but that's not the focus of my presentation today. Um, I will be talking about uh, the main uh, thrust of his uh, the most famous work and the one that he was uh, most recognized for in the Abel Prize, uh, which is his um, being one of the founders of the theory of wavelets. So wavelets are these special functions um, uh, which have some oscillation and some spatial localization uh, and some additional properties too, which make them very useful for signal processing. So signal processing, this is the study of, uh, is, it is the science of digital data. And nowadays, digital data is everywhere. Uh, ev anytime you have a computer or a phone or a tablet or the internet, you're always dealing with digital data. And there's many, many types of digital data that we have to deal with. Um, but from a mathematical point of view, um, you can treat many, many classes of data in the same mathematical framework. Uh, so for example, sound is a good example of, of digital data. A sound wave, here's a sound wave. Um, mathematically, you can think of it as one-dimensional data. Uh, the dimension is time, um, and for every point in time, there is some amplitude, and that's a sound wave. And so mathematically, it's just a, a one-dimensional function. Uh, we also have two-dimensional data. Uh, here's an image of a famous museum in Oslo. Um, and it is a two-dimensional piece of data. Okay, so uh, the, the, the two dimensions are x and y, um, width and height, and for every point in x and y, you have, uh, you have uh, some, some color or some intensity, so you have some function of two variables, two-dimensional data. Um, and then you have three-dimensional data, like videos. Uh, so a video looks flat, uh, looks two-dimensional, but it, it's actually, from a mathematical point of view, it's actually three-dimensional data, because it's also time. So for every x and y, and for every time, there is some color or some, some intensity, and th that function of three variables describes um, a video. And in signal processing, we also study four and five and six height. You know, the, the, there's this, uh, this uh, um, we study data of, of any dimensions. But, um, okay, but all this type of data, you can treat all of them using the theory of wavelets. So when you analyze data digitally, you have to represent the data um, by decomposing it into manageable pieces, um, into, into simple uh, components. Um, so one of the, most direct and obvious ways to, to represent data is to take a, st a spatial representation, or if it's a time series, a, a time representation. Um, and th that just breaks up your signal into individual data points uh, localized in a single point in space or a single point in time. So for example, if you have an image, uh, you can represent the image as a bitmap. This is a, uh, um, the basic example of a spatial representation. You, you decompose every point in this, um, image into, a, you, you call them pixels, and every pixel you have a color and intensity, and you just store the colors one by one as an array, and this is a bitmap representation of this image. So uh, this is, um, it's, a, it's good for some things. It has no loss, and it is um, very good for, for um, discerning the very fine scale structure of your image, but it's, um, it's very inefficient spatially um, uh, in terms of uh, how much storage space you need to, to store the image. For example, an image like this, it might take um, a million pixels to represent this image. Um, and also, it's very hard to see large scale structure. Right? If, you, if, if your computer just sees an array of pixels, it is not immediately obvious how to program the computer to recognize that this is a deer, for instance. At the other extreme, uh, another type of representation is the Fourier transform, which is now about 200 years old. So um, 
This is the opposite, in many ways, of spatial representation. Um, you take a signal, like maybe the sound wave or there's, there's some other sort of wave here, and um, the mathematics of Fourier analysis lets you decompose this, uh, this wave into um, plane waves, sinusoidal waves, that, that, you know, the, the, the sine and cosine waves from trigonometry. Um, and um, sometimes you can represent a wave using just a, a finite number of, of, of these uh, plane waves, Fourier modes, sometimes you need an infinite number. But um, thanks to Fourier and uh, his descendants, uh, we know that uh, uh, we can always do this. Any pretty much any signal can be written as a superposition of, um, of, uh, of, of sinusoids. And you can use that to, anal to store and analyze your data. Um, this is very useful for many applications. For example, if you want to understand uh, long, uh, large-scale um, oscillations, like, for example, seasonal variations in some time series, um, then the Fourier transform is very good for that. But, um, uh, but it is very um, hard to see fine-scale structure. So, you know, very um, fine-scale features, um, you know, like, like corners and edges of, uh, of, an, of an image are difficult to discern using the Fourier representation. And in terms of storage, it is just as inefficient as the uh, spatial representation. So the wavelet transform, the wavelet representation, combines the best of both worlds of the spatial representation and the Fourier representation. So it, um, it is a representation which, like the spatial representation, it is very localized. You can see fine scale features. But like the Fourier representation, it, is, it, it also uh, has the ability to detect large scale structure. So um, here's a comparison of the two, of the Fourier representation and the wavelet representation for a single image. This is a, a single, uh, simple signal here, this, this, this spiky uh, wave here. Um, so the Fourier transform would decompose this, uh, this signal into an infinite number of these sinusoids. Um, whereas in contrast, the, uh, the wavelet transform would, would decompose the same signal into an infinite number of wavelets which oscillate a little bit like the sine wave, but whereas the, the sine waves oscillate f um, forever, they have no spatial localization, um, the wavelets are cut off in a certain special way to, to, become, uh, to become almost zero or exactly zero after a certain point. So these are both representations, but there are certain advantages to the wavelet representation. Um, so when you decompose uh, this particular signal, you actually need an infinite number of, of, of sinusoids um, if you keep just the most important ones, uh, the seven biggest uh, Fourier modes here, to recon if you reconstruct the signal just using this, this, these seven modes, you get um, a rather um, poor reconstruction. You know, the sharp corners have been uh, rounded off to, um, uh, to, something, um, to something fuzzier here, and you get all these os oscillatory artifacts which don't represent the, the true signal. Um, but if you instead use a wavelet basis to approximate the original signal, you get a much better reconstruction. The, 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 uh, the edge features are much um, more faithfully reconstructed, and there are fewer um, um, artifacts of oscillation coming from the representation, so with even just seven of these wavelets. So um, a key feature of the wavelet transform, which underlies so many of its applications, is uh, something called sparse representation. So I told you that if you represent, an, uh, say, an image, either as a spatial representation or as a Fourier representation, uh, you need a lot of storage space to store all the data. For example, uh, this is an image of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, you notice that, that most of the pixels here are, are white or, or brown. Um, you have to store all of these pixels if you want to store the bitmap. If you only store a fraction of, 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 of the maybe 100,000 or so of the pixels here, you will get to, you have big holes in your image. Um, but if you take a wavelet transform, so there's a, this is, there's a certain special type of wavelet transform called the half wavelet transform, which is what is being used here. Um, you, can, you can break up this um, image into wavelets. Um, over here, th these are the, the finest scale wavelets, the narrowest wavelets. Uh, th these uh, um, these compo describe the, um, the, the finest scale structure of this image. For example, these cables here are fairly well represented by this uh, fine scale. And then there's some medium scale features like the, 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 the main structure of the bridge. Um, and then over here are the coarsest components of the, um, uh, of the image, like, like the background sky and so forth. Um, but one thing you notice when you apply this transform is that most of the coefficients here, uh, most of the image is black. So most of the coefficients here are either zero or close to zero. 
um, which means that you could actually discard, you know, 90% of the of, of, of the of the coefficients here, just keep the the significant ones, and you still get a very good representation of your image. Um, so you, ha you have this very sparse way to to describe almost all of your image, and so the wavelets um, have this sparse representation property when applied to many classes of real-world data. So this type of sparse representation property has many, many applications. Um, many modern routines in signal processing rely on the ability to, to find a sparse representation of your data. And um, in many cases, the, the sparse representation of choice is the wavelet re representation. So for example, um, image compression is, is the, was the first example. Uh, if you want to compress an image to something smaller so that you can take more pictures on your phone or you can send uh, images over the internet faster, uh, you need to compress uh, your image. So you don't use bitmaps, you use maybe um, GIFs or, or JPEG format. Uh, one of the major formats for image compression is JPEG 2000. And th that, uh, that particular format actually is, is exactly using the wavelet transformations developed by Meyer and his uh, collaborators. Um, there's also applications to denoising. If you have, uh, say, a sound signal or video signal which has a lot of artifacts, a lot of interference, noise, you can use wavelets to remove the noise and keep the, uh, the, the, the portion of the data that you actually want to keep. Um, if you want to detect features like edges, you have an image of a face, you want to find out the boundaries of the face, where the eyes and ears and, and mouth are, you can use wavelets to, to help with that. Um, you can solve differential equations, like the fluid equations, numerically, um, using wa uh, the wavelet basis. It can be a very convenient basis for, for many of these applications. Actually, nowadays, we used um, descendants of wavelets, um, uh, other bases which were uh, adapted from the original wavelet decomposition. Um, there's a lot of CGI, which uh, involves wavelets, especially when you model any sign of kind of object with both fine scale and coarse scale structure. So curves and surfaces with some, some sort of ripples in them. And anything, anything like that is, is good for, um, uh, is uh, suitable for wavelet representation. Um, a more modern application in the last 10 years is compressed sensing. Um, this, this is um, a way to, um, a, a new paradigm for, for taking measurements of, of data, um, in, in some sense trying to measure um, the wavelet coefficients of, um, of, of, uh, of an image or some other source uh, more or less directly, rather than taking an entire image with high resolution and then extracting the the, uh, the wavelet coefficients afterwards. Um, so this is uh, something actually I worked in a few years back. Um, and it's used, for instance, to speed up um, um, magne magnetic resonance imaging. Um, an image that might have taken two minutes to, to scan a, a human body, it, it can now take 10 seconds um, uh, using these compressed sensing methods. And uh, they're all based on sparse representations, and many of these algorithms use wavelets. So wavelets come in many forms. Uh, there are many types of wavelets, and, and they're suitable for different applications. Um, one of the main early contributions of Meyer was the development of a general theoretical framework, um, in particular um, his multi-resolution analysis framework of, uh, with Mellar, which allows um, one to design wavelets sort of a la carte, you know, that if, if you want a wavelet with a certain property, uh, you, can, you, uh, you, you, um, you can find one. So, you know, if you want a nice simple wavelet, maybe you can, you can take uh, this Ha wavelet here. If you want a smooth wavelet, you can maybe take Meyer's original wavelets. If you want a compactly supported wavelet, you can take um, Ingrid Dabashi's wavelet, and so forth. There are many, many wavelets used now in, the, in, um, um, in various applications, and which one to use depends on what application uh, you, want, you want to do, but they can all be generated by Meyer's sort of unified framework. So that's uh, just a small taste of, of what he has contributed to mathematics. So I think that is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. So at this stage, the tradition is that uh, we now call the Abel Laureate to congratulate him and ask him a few questions. Uh, unfortunately, he, he was not available to take the call live. Um, however, we did record uh, a conversation with him just a few um, hours ago, so I think that will be played next and now. Okay. So, go ahead. All right. So, uh, 
Okay, so first of all, uh, congr congratulations uh, on, on, on your Arbor Prize. Thanks. It's very well deserved. Um, so how do you feel, actually? I am, uh, yes. <laughs> I feel at the same time happy, surprised, and slightly guilty. <laughs> I, can, I can understand that. So, you can understand it. Yeah. No, it, yeah. So, can you describe how, um, where you were and how you were notified of the prize? Um, yeah, I was in my, uh, in my home and uh, uh, I was called at uh, 9 uh, 15 uh, from, uh, I think, the Academy of uh, Science and, and uh, Letters of Oslo. And uh, I received the announcement uh, this morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was your immediate reaction? I was. Uh, I, I was. Uh, it was. It was uh, such a surprise that I was. Like, it was a shock. My reaction was uh, being slightly shocked by by the news. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe you. It will probably take a while to, uh, uh, to recover. So, um, about mathematics. So, uh, yes. you're being recognized for your work in wavelets. So, yes. um, you saw the connection between um, the empirical wavelet transforms that were being used in science and um, the, re the reproducing formulas used in harmonic analysis by Calderon. Yes. So, yes. How, how did you find this connection? What, what made you... Um, uh, uh, the, the story is very interesting. I was uh, working at Ecole Polytechnique mm -hmm. nearby uh, is a, a group, a department of uh, math mathematical physics. And the head of the department, Jean Lascou, was, uh, he was a very open-minded uh, guy and he, he loved discussing with me. He was uh, reading almost everything, and he, mo he was always making Xerox copies. And we had only one Xerox copy machine, in such a way that uh, for making a Xerox copy, I had to wait, he, he finished. And I loved waiting and discussing with him. And one day, he said to me, if I received just this paper, this preprint uh, uh, from Alex Grossman, I am sure that should interest you. So he gave me the preprint, and it was the first work on wavelengths. So Alex Grossman is a physicist. Mm -hmm. he, he has a joint work with Eli Stein. Mm. Oh. Uh, on quantum mechanics. So there is a paper by Ila Stein and Alex Grossman. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I immediately recognize uh, Calderon reproducing formula, but the great news is that this was already applied by Grossman and Morley, who was an engineer at El Fakiten, an oil company, and uh, uh, Morley was using this tool for all prospection. So it was, so the story began before I entered the group. It is very interesting. The, and uh, what they used is a continuous wave, so uh, the computation load was heavy, and uh, my only merit has been to find orthonormal basis, uh, which led uh, to, to, to the ra rapid uh, uh, computational. And uh, uh, on the other hand, I just found a, a, a piece of uh, the whole uh, building because uh, Stephen Mala understood, uh, who is almost a student of mine, but not in the strict sense, because he worked in a very independent way, found the connection with quadrature mirror filter which was a tool we, 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 uh, which was already used by electrical engineers. So the landscape was uh, open to application through this connection. So the connection through orthonormal wavelet basis and by Stefan Mala, uh, quadratic mirror filters. Okay. 
<laughs> That's quite an involved story. Um, it, it, it is very surprising because uh, the beginning is uh, just like, uh, like uh, a fairy tale. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it was quite uh, serendipitous. So this Arbor Prize is recognizing both um, contributions to pure and applied mathematics, uh, which yes. is unusual for the Arbor Prize, actually. Um, yes. So in your opinion, how, how do the two fields of mathematics relate to each other? Do you view them as, as a unified s subject or as separate? Yeah, and as to me, uh, the way I'm working is uh, more or less following the, follow, uh, the philosophy of a movement which uh, sprang in the States in the 50s, just after the war, and which was called uh, the Center for the Unity of Science. And this was founded by von Neumann and uh, scientists coming from Vienna, which uh, who, who belong to the Vienna Circle. So this, uh, in that time, uh, in the early 50s, people recognized that uh, ideas coming uh, from signal processing, from uh, telecommunication, uh, from mathematics, and uh, even linguistics uh, could be unified with uh, a, 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 in a very deep way uh, leading to a new science. And uh, the objective was also uh, to, uh, uh, to extend the teaching of science that the unified viewpoint would, be, would make the teaching easier. Uh, there, was, there was a beautiful contribution uh, in Dedalus, uh, which is uh, a, a, a publication of the Academy of Arts and Science about this movement for the unity of science. And uh, for me, it, is, it, it opened my eyes, and uh, I felt it was exactly what I was doing all the time, not the unified view. And in the case of Wavelets, for example, the fact that I worked with a, a physicist in quantum mechanics like Alex Rossman, with an engineer, and similarly with people in uh, uh, electrical engineering, engineering, for example, was a kind of happiness. Uh, I was uh, this large land scale. In the case of Wilder, there is even more, a more beautiful story. It is a discovery by uh, uh, David Huber and, uh, uh, and uh, Thorsten Wiesel of uh, uh, neurons which are specialized in detecting edges in images, in the image received by the retina. And uh, the way these neurons detect edges is exactly an application of the wave transformation. So that has been uh, made explicit by uh, Huber and David Marr in his beautiful book in such a way that the landscape was even broader, you know. It included the, uh, the understanding of the brain. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then I reached a kind of happiness I've never experimented before. Oh. You know, it, it's, it's great to see science being so unified in your worldview. Yes. So, uh, what are you thinking about uh, nowadays? What, what are you uh, nowadays, about wavelets, what I, I, I feel, I feel very happy because it, it sprang a new piece of mathematics uh, called the compressed sensing, uh, which has been developed by uh, Emmanuel Cantes, mm -hmm. and I am also extremely happy because Emmanuel Cantes was my student uh, in, uh, mm. in the qualifying exam. So he, he, he took my qualifying exam in uh, Paris, but then he wanted, for some uh, personal reason, to study abroad. So I decided that I could propose him to study with David Dono. And then David Dono, after uh, uh, 
competing, when uh, Emmanuel Kant has completed his PhD and obtained his first particular result, during a conference uh, that, that he was uh, doing, uh, he made the following statement that sending Kant's to the States was the best service I made to science. Which is a very funny statement, and I love that. So, uh, Emmanuel Candès uh, wrote the post wavelet uh, uh, novel, or, uh, uh, and uh, his uh, theory of compression is something extremely beautiful and application to image processing. And then I, I cannot uh, prevent me from mentioning your joint work with Emmanuel Candès. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was mostly Candace's work, actually. Yeah, yeah. No, it, uh, that was always that was a great uh, collaboration. Well, it was great talking to you, uh, Yves, and uh, uh, con congratulations again. And uh, we'll thank you. Hope to see you in May in Oslo. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for calling. Okay. I would like to thank the audience for coming here today. The announcement of this year's Abel Prize Laureate will be followed up at the House of Literature in Oslo tonight. At 6 p.m., the public is invited into the realm of mathematics. The work of the Abel Laureate, if Mayer, will be presented by Terence Tau. TV host and science journalist Eldri Borgan and Magnus Deli Vigeland, mathematician and professional circus artist, will guide us through the evening. I also have the pleasure of welcoming you to the Abel Prize Awards ceremony at the University Aula in Oslo on Tuesday, 23rd of May at 2 p.m. If Mayer will receive the Abel Prize from His Majesty King Harald V. The ceremony will be followed by a reception at the Norske Teater, where TV host and journalist Nadia Hasnaoui will interview the laureate. You are most welcome to join us in celebrating Yves Meyer.